Well, welcome to you for our brief reflection on a psalm to help feed into our prayers. And we're in Psalm 8, which I'm going to begin by reading. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against our enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Well, Psalm 8 makes for a very satisfying sandwich, doesn't it? Because you've got um, the two bits of bread, verses 1 and 9, that repeated refrain, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then verses... Um, well, 1b through to 8 are the substantial meaty filling uh, in between the bread. So just in this brief few moments that I've got, I want to uh, think about two big themes, but I hope that will inspire and encourage us to pray confidently to our great God. And, and the first is just that, how great our God is. What an awesome God he is. His majesty is in all the earth. Um, Lord our Lord, how majestic is your name in, or, or, or perhaps you're familiar with other translations, over all the earth. God's greatness is, is to be seen in what he has made. And I suppose particularly at summertime, we have lots of opportunity to go out and to consider God's creation. And that, that should make us mindful of how wonderful God is. God's glory overall actually puts humanity in its proper place. And we'll talk a bit about that in just a moment. Um, do you share that sense of awe whenever you get into the natural world? The sea does it particularly for me. I find the sea very awe-inspiring. It's powerful, restless. It kind of changes according to, to the seasons and, and I'll, as you probably know, will do anything I can do to be by the sea. The psalmist perhaps has got more of a countryside feel to it. He's looking at the, the beauty of the creative plant world, of the animal life, um, of the trees, and all the things that God has made make his heart swell with a sense of glory towards God. And actually, it's important we make a distinction here because Christians do share with, with many non-Christians a concern over our world, over, over planet Earth. Um, however, we've got an added reason for being concerned about the world, not because we worship the created order. We're not going to go and hug trees, but we do worship the God who made it. And because God don't make no junk, we worship him for the great world that he's made. And I think a psalm like this encourages us to be out in the creation to see something of the beauty of his world. What's the chief end of man? We often quote from the Westminster Shorter Catechism to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, to bring him praise that is rightly his and to find joy in him. And actually, we do that very often by looking at the works of his hands. So, you know, that's that's the beginning and the end of the psalm, the bread, as it were, um, that everything begins and ends in worship. God has made everything that there is to bring him praise and honour and glory. And when we worship, we kind of chime in with the whole created order. We chime in with the heavenly beings in giving God the worth that is due to him. And I hope that over these summer months, you 
as lockdown, lockdown has started to ease, can get out in the natural world to give glory to your creator God and that your heart will swell with a sense of wonder at how great God is. The second thing, and I use this phrase advisedly, but is that this psalm puts humanity in its proper place. And its proper place actually might be a bit of a surprise to us in some respects. So yes, of course, verse three and four talk about how our smallness. So when I consider your heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars, which you set in place, what is mankind? What, what's humanity that you're mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? And, and we feel small. I mean, you know, nobody stands at the edge of the Grand Canyon and thinks how great they are. They stand there because they have a sense of their smallness in the light of the majesty of some of God's creation. And actually, you know, it's right that we consider, as the psalmist says, your heavens, the work of your hands. And as we ponder them, we have a sense of how great God is, how small by comparison we are. But actually, that doesn't belittle humankind. In fact, it rather gives us a sense of dignity, I believe, because in verses five to eight, the, the, the greatness of human beings um, is spelt out. You know, we're, we're made a little lower than the angels and yet crowned with glory and honour. We're given the power to rule over the works of your hands, to have dominion, as Genesis 1 puts it. Um, all fl flocks and herds, animals of the wild, birds of the sea, sorry, birds of the sky, fish of the sea, and everything that swims in it. So actually we have we have dignity, we are made in his image for this purpose of exercising dominion, not to rampage over creation, but actually rather to play our part in cooperation. And, you know, sometimes we will talk using Calvinistic language about um, the depravity of human beings, that, you know, we are totally depraved. And I think it's important we understand what Calvin meant when he wrote about that. He, he meant that there's no part of a human being that's not been tainted and corrupted by sin. He didn't mean by that that we're utterly depraved. Actually, human beings are fearfully and wonderfully made, as another psalm says, that we are given dignity because he's breathed his life and put his spirit in us. And we find our true humanity and identity in reflecting the creator in how we operate in his created world. So that's our proper place. Below our majestic, wonderful, awesome God, but actually above the rest of the created world because we've been made in his image. And therefore, in a sense, we have greatness planted within. And one of the reasons why we would be sure that this is what the psalm is saying about humanity is because of the way that it's applied several times in the New Testament um, to Jesus. It's got a, kind of got a double application. I think it does talk about ordinary men, women and children, but I think it applies as both Hebrews and 1 Corinthians and Ephesians do supremely to the perfect God man. So let me just read you two passages that speak about that. So this is Hebrews 2 verse 5. Um, here he's speaking about the full humanity of Jesus. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, which is Psalm 8, what is mankind that you're mindful of them, the son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour and put everything under their feet. And if you've got that passage opened, um, the, uh, the, the the you could also be he. So put everything under his feet, applying to Jesus. So he goes on in the rest of that verse. And putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus who is made lower than the angels for a little while, but now crowned with glory and honour because he suffered so that the grace of God might um, taste death for everyone. 
So Jesus is the archetypal human being and he came to perfectly reveal God and we will go where he has already gone in due course and he's blazed a trail as it were for us. And similarly, do look up um, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 26, that speaks of a similar theme, that where Jesus has taken our humanity, we will in due course follow. Well, my time's um, gone because actually there's so much in this psalm. But think of these two things, the greatness of God and humanity in its proper place. Um, and maybe now as we go into prayer, uh, allow your mind to be stretched in worship of God. We're made for that worship. Um, and in a very busy, active age, you know, people will tell us, well, worship's a waste of time, really. You're, you could be using your time more profitably. No, you couldn't. You're made to worship him. So spend that time in worship. And allow yourself to be humbled and awed in his presence. So as we focus upon the greatness of God, we see ourselves in our proper place. And be thankful that he cares even for little old you, that God has set his spirit on you and put his image in you and he loves you and he's delighted for you come to him with your prayers and intercessions let's pray father god what a rich psalm we pray that you would help us to be filled with a sense of awe at your majesty and your greatness and we thank you that as we get out into your creation we can just get a glimpse of who you are we see your fingerprints left all over the world you've made and Lord, humble us afresh in your presence and make us truly grateful to be human beings made in your image. In Jesus' name. Amen.